Yes, so my name is uh, Ole Bjerg and I come from the Copenhagen Business School. And first I would like to say thanks to Gianluca and Donica and Audrey and Marie and the rest of the organizers for setting this up. I'm very pleased and excited to be here. Um, and what I'm going to present to you are some philosophical perspectives on Bitcoin. <coughs> and I think you will recognize some of the things that I'm going to talk about. You will recognize some of the things that uh, Gianluca has already uh, touched upon. <coughs> I would like to ask you, how many of you uh, own Bitcoin? So and so I'm gonna so for those of you who may not be so familiar with the Bitcoin, some of it may be you may not catch that on, but some of you are not familiar with the philosophy, uh, maybe some of the things there will be new to you, but I hope that you would also should be you should all be able to sort of uh, follow the general argument and, and also feel free to ask. I, rather than moving all of the questions to the end, I will sort of open up in the middle also for questions. So you can also just ask uh, uh, as I'm, I'm talking. So I think in, in 2013, I think was the year where Bitcoin sort of gained the public, general public uh, awareness. And I think what sparked that or what triggered that was, was a number of factors, but I think the primary one was this explosive growth in the price of bitcoins which makes a lot of people interested in, uh, in this uh, phenomenon and so in, in November 2013 the price peaked so far at some around I think it was around 1200 US dollars for a bitcoin or something like that and then it went down after that um, and, and still when I talk to people about Bitcoin, people always or tend to ask, so, so is it going to rise again? Is it gonna, are we going to see a new um, uh, increase in the price of, uh, of Bitcoin? And I think, of course, these kinds of speculations are fun if you have some Bitcoin, uh, especially if you hold them for uh, speculation. However, I think we should be careful not to necessarily equate the value of Bitcoin with the price so that we should say, well, the future of Bitcoin can, or the state of Bitcoin or the value of Bitcoin can be measured by whatever uh, exchange rate towards uh, conventional currencies we see. Because um, I, think, I think for me, the, the value of, or for me, Bitcoin has another value, another much more profound value which we cannot measure in uh, money. And this you could say this for me, I can say it's kind of a philosophical or ideological value. Because I think um, one of the major achievements of Bitcoin is that it's, it, it has sort of triggered, or it's, it's a good trigger for our thinking about money. Because it kind of provokes us to ask questions such as, such as what is money, where does it come from, and even how could it be different. And of course, it's not like we have. It's not like there hasn't been alternative currencies or alternative monies before Bitcoin. But I think few of these have had the impact on the public imagination about money uh, that uh, Bitcoin has had. Um, I think this, that's also what this conference is about: is to get us to think about these uh, questions. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to present first. I'm going to talk, give you some general reflections on money, and I will be that will be based on my book that I forgot my hotel, <laughs> which is called Making Money. It came out the last year, and then uh, from that I will move into Bitcoin, and then at the end I will 
present you with sort of my ideal ideas about uh, ideal money, what kind of money would I like to see in the future. So, um, when, if you look into, or the type of question that typically pops up when you start talking about money is this, what is money? I think uh, Gianluca also had it on one of his slides, what is money? Um, this is also, also the kind of question you find in the standard economics textbooks. And um, I think one should be careful with this question because I think once you've, even once you've posed that question, you seem to be already sort of caught in an intellectual trap because this question, although it seems innocent, it's like, oh, what is money? I want to start philosophizing about this. Uh, the thing is, it seems to assume or take for granted a number of things. One is that money lends itself to one definition. We can define what is money. Another one is that money has this trans-historical essence. So even though, of course, we see that money systems change, this question, what is money, presupposes that, yeah, 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 but underneath these historical variations, there is this essence of money that we can find. And finally, also, it, it's tends, it tends, this question, tend, uh, what is money, it tends to uh, assume that money is one thing, that, that, um, and as we're going to see, that's uh, not the truth at all. So I think one should have tried, or at least depending on what you want to do with, with, with your question, but uh, one should uh, perhaps avoid this question and pose another question. And what I've done, uh, even working in the field of philosophy, I, one of my favorite philosophers is Heidegger. And I think he's, a, he's for me, he's like the champion of posing questions. So um, what I've done is that I've used sort of his approach to questioning, and I've posed the question, how is money? How is money? And the idea of posing this, the question of money in this fashion is that rather than asking what is money, we should ask into the, um, what Heidegger calls the science professor of money. So the constitution of being of money. And this may, I mean, it may sound like I'm splitting hairs here, or what, what does that mean? But the idea is that we should ask into the very being of money rather than try to define it as a distinct being. Yeah. If you're not familiar with the idea, maybe that may sound like sophistry. But anyway, so I'm going to show you how I, I go about this, and, and perhaps it's, uh, it will, or hopefully it will be uh, clear. Um, so what? I, so in my, my book, my Making Money book, the, the way I make sense of this question is to use Shishi to sort of map out the ontology of money. Uh, I think also, you know, one of the things that's also in this question is that um, I think for me the this the, there's a certain you might say untick undecidability which is inherent in money. So it's the, the, the fact that we cannot sort of pin it down and say this is what money is, maybe that's maybe that's a defining characteristic of money itself. So that's what we want to get at. We want to get at this undecidability and yet still try to sort of systematize this. And for that, you, for that, I've used uh, Shishek, Slavo Shishek, another philosopher, a more contemporary philosopher, at least he's not uh, dead. Um, and I use him to sort of map out an ontology of money, uh, and I, I identify three sort of fundamental theories of money that I'm going to go through, the commodity theory, the state theory, and the credit theory. And these three theories then co correspond, so Shishik has this distinction between sort of three ontological realms, he talks about the real, the symbolic, and the imaginary. So I sort of fit these three dimensions of money, however, none of them can sort of stand alone and say, this is what money is. And when we want to understand concrete money systems, such as, for instance, uh, Bitcoin, we need to see how all of these three uh, dimensions are at play at the same time. Um, yeah, so that's, I'm going to uh, present these, uh, I think I, I want to move that one up. 
I was trying, uh, but... Oh, we can't do that at all. Well, what about this whiteboard? Yeah, I can do that, but then people can't really see. Screen? Is not this? Oh, there we go. So, sometimes <coughs> Shishik, he illustrates these three, this uh, ontological, uh, these three ontological realms with this figure. And this is, this is also sometimes referred to as a Borromean nut. So you should imagine that these three circles are, no, I'm not going to do it. English, it's just me. Yeah. So let's call this one, we'll say this is the real. This is the symbolic. So if we start over here with the real, this is where I locate what is known as the commodity theory of money. And the idea of this theory is to sort of ground the value of money in sort of real uh, materiality. So what this theory says is that um, money is ultimately a commodity and usually the theory will say, and it's typically a precious metal, it's typically gold. So this is, this is the kind of theory that says ultimately money is, is gold. And it's the, it's the kind of theory that we find in Adam Smith. You know his, uh, his famous um, parable or example, or whatever we like to call it, about the butcher, the brewer, and the, the, butcher, the, brewer, and the baker, I believe it is, who, who, who do this barter. And then all of a sudden one of them comes up with the idea, ah, oh, let's uh, use... Uh, it's, let's use gold as well. Yeah, that's a really good idea. And then they start trading with gold and then they get money all of a sudden. So it's also a theory about how money sort of emerges more or less spontaneously out of the market. Um, we can also find it in Marx. We can find it, as I've said before, in economics textbooks. And we can also find it in, if you've ever been to a museum of money, you will notice, I've been to a, a number of these, and in fact, what they are, they, they say that they are they will tell you the story of money, but what they actually tell you is the story of coins. So they will start saying, well, back in the day, or in the old days, or originally, uh, money was uh, <laughs> some kind of object, coins or uh, gold or whatever, and then they developed into this, 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 and then we had notes, and then we had this. And however, these, these um, museums, they really tell you the story about debt. Uh, or violence or stuff like that. So it's a very sort of nice story about uh, money. And in a way, the commodity theory is it's also a very nice story. This right here is the commodity theory. Uh, no, right. Because it's kind of an apolitical theory of money. It's like, yeah, so money comes out of the market and there's no violence is still none of it. Uh, so that's one theory. Another theory is uh, the state theory. State theory of money. What this theory says, uh, what this theory says is that, well, ultimately, money is a legal construct. It's a creation of the law. So the way that money is made is by uh, a state power or another sovereign power. And what, what the sovereign does is that on the one hand, the sovereign will designate particular uh, objects. This could be, it could be coins, but it could also just be notes. Um, and say, from now on, I'm going to say, this is money. This will count as money. And then perhaps uh, the citizen will say, yeah, okay, fine, you can play that game. Uh, we don't believe that. It's just a piece of paper. We can't use it for anything. And then the sorrow would say, yeah, yeah, fine, you don't have to believe it. However, in a year, I will come back and I will collect a certain amount of these pieces of paper for each of you in taxes. So you better start uh, seeing if you can get a hold of something. And that way, the, the state, the sovereign, sort of creates a circulation of uh, money. Um, it is, uh, so it's a combination of taxes, the imposition of taxes or fines or something like that on the one hand, and legal table laws on the other hand. And this is 
is a theory that is, um, you can find it in George Friedrich uh, Knapp, uh, and you can, it's, it's kind of also the theory that you find in uh, Keynes, although there's also elements of other theories in Keynes, but he refers a lot to, uh, to Knapp uh, Keynes. And the reason why I associate this with the symbolic is because up here, boom, those of you who are familiar with physics will know that in the realm of the symbolic is where we find the law. So, in, in, so or you can also say, well, this says that that uh, money is a social construction. Um, so the third theory, the third theory, is uh, the credit. And what the credit theory says is that basically money is debt. Money is just the other side of debt. Um, and if we look at if we look at money in our contemporary context, we can see that the money, uh, Januka also touched upon this. Most of the money that we use today is is the money that is sitting in our bank accounts. And so we move that we, we, when we pay this money. This money is moved from my bank account to someone else's, uh, Gianluca's bank account or someone else's. So it's moved from one bank to another. But this money is nothing but the bank's debt to me. So my credit money is the bank's debt to me. And in that sense, uh, most of the money in circulation today is nothing but bank credit or bank debt to us. The banks owe us a lot of money, and that is what we use as money. So this theory, the credit theory, we can find this theory in uh, a number of, uh, there's a, a guy called Alfred Innes, there's uh, Ludwig von Mises, the Schumpeter, and contemporary authors that uh, talk about this is uh, Richard Werner or Steve Keen, and even uh, last year, the Bank of England came out with a report saying, yes, it is true. It is true that most of the money in circulation is created by commercial banks. So it's not, it's not the central banks that make the money. It is, in fact, the commercial, the private commercial banks that make uh, most of the money in circulation. Uh, and they do that when you take out loans. So when I take out a loan in my bank, the, the bank doesn't take this money from elsewhere, it just puts it into my account. And that's how most of the money in circulation is created. So the Bank of England kind of also recognizes this theory. The reason why I put it here with the imaginary is, for Shishi, the imaginary is the realm of fantasies. It's, it's, the, it's the realm where we sort of imagine that at some future point in time, we will gain, get some sort of satisfaction or redemption or something like that. And I think uh, that's also what lies behind debt, is that when you have a debt or if you have a credit, there's, some, there's the idea that at some point in the future, this credit is going to be redeemed. I can get something else for it. Um, the thing, of course, the, the, the paradox is of course that if most of the money is bank credit money, how do, how would we redeem this money? How can that be redeemed? Of course, we can buy stuff for it, but um, you would also think, well, maybe if we wanted to, we could get real money. We could get state money for this. However, the this, yeah, this is common knowledge, I guess. But there's a since the amount of credit money in circulation is so vast in uh, proportion to the amount of physical money that we can't all get this, we can't all redeem our credit money in, uh, in physical money. <laughs> yeah? So where would you fit John Lucas' theory of money's platforms into this schema? Um, well, it, it, I, I, said, I, would say it dep I, I, I would say it depends on what kind we would have to look at a particular platform and then ask ourselves, how are these three dimensions in play in a particular? And in a minute, I'm going to do that with the Bitcoin. But I would, I would say we could do that with other platforms as well. So, but if we should just, if I should just apply this to the way that money 
functions today, and I've already touched upon it. If we start down here, the, the kind of money we find here is uh, the kind of money we use when we use our credit card. So here's a Visa card. And the kind of money we have, have up here would be the physical money. Uh, so this is a 100 euro note. The question is, what do we find down here? What, what would be sort of the real dimension? Sometimes we say, well, uh, you know, the, the, what we have today is a, a, a purely virtual. We've had a virtualization of the economy and futures trading and all that story. So does that mean that this money system doesn't sort of connect to anything? Anyone has a proposal? What, what, what could we put here? It's kind of confusing because it seems like if there's anything, I don't know, bring up stuff that John Luke was talking about yeah. in Nigel, that maybe the value is something that's socially produced, but that seems to fit into the kind of symbolic yeah, yeah, yeah. areas. So, I don't know. Yeah. Luxury goods are actually beyond the necessities for living. The Rolex is the, the eye watches. Luxury goods. So you put symbols, things tangible. Yes. So you put any anything we could buy with money beyond what we need. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's <coughs> one. Uh, yeah, that could be one. Luxury goods. Any gold. other? Gold. Gold. Why do you put gold down here? What 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 role does gold play in our contemporary money system? It's trading. Yeah. 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 yeah, but does it does gold does gold have another role than say coal or oil? So there's this idea that when everything, when everything collapses, it will all come down to what's real. I would argue with that. I would argue that 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 builds that ultimately builds on exactly this theory to say, well, ultimately money is gold. So when all of this explodes, we will sort of face that. However, those of you who know she knows that this notion of the real is it's much more elusive, and I would say. Maybe rather than saying so, go and money is valuable because it's ultimately gold. I would say maybe it's the other way around. Gold is ultimately valuable because it's money. Which means that if this all of this explodes, maybe gold may not be so valuable. We don't know. Uh, but different things have intrinsic value at different moments in time. Yeah. So could that be a real commodity, say if you're in a situation of water or something? Yeah. Yes, and that has an intrinsic value. Yeah. There's, there's no, not necessarily an exact answer to this. However, I would, and then I'm going to give you the exact answer. <laughs> <laughs> so what I would put here is this. A house. I would say this is the wheel of our contemporary economy. Why? Because if you want to go into the bank and take out some money, what are, what are they going to ask you? They're going to say, yeah, that sounds great, you have a job, however, do you have any collateral? And then I'll say, yes, I have a house. And then the bank says, oh, great, yeah, fine, well, we'll give you the loan. Uh, and that's also why, as you see, it's obvious now that our the, the state of our entire economy sort of hinges on the property market, right? So right now there's a, we're starting to blow up another bubble in the property markets, and everyone is like, the politicians are like, yeah, it's going well, and now we're gonna, uh, yeah, the crisis is over and all that. So it's sort of weirdly, these houses are sort of weirdly tied into this whole uh, formula system. Yeah? Would you put, sorry, I'm going No, no, go ahead. But would you put labor there as well? Because obviously if you're borrowing money, that's also based on a sort of contract over time, which you yeah. financialize. So the fact that you'll work for 40 or 50 yeah. years. I think, I think this is also, in a way, this is all. Mm, I think it kind of depends on what kind of analysis you would want to make. Uh, however, I, I, I think that in a way we've moved.
beyond, we could have, you know, we kind of move beyond uh, uh, an economy where, where labor was such a crucial. I just agree. Thing. I think it's, it's, it's become much more pervasive, maybe. Yeah, it's true. Most of us, labor. I mean, we don't do real labor anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's still, like, that's still valuable. In fact, it's worse well, than yeah, we're, even your health insurance yeah. or your yeah, yeah, your, yeah. Even your future pensions, yeah. all those things are financial. Yeah. So yeah. maybe those are I think things. it's I mean it's also it's it's a little bit up in the air because I think it's also I, it, it depends on what kind of uh, it's what kind of analysis you want to make or so um, I think um, I think I, I I like to just leave this one here. The, so this is our general uh, theory. And what I'm going to do now is then uh, look at, so that comes back to your uh, question with the Bitcoin. So how can we, I want to use this theory to sort of evaluate Bitcoin or say what, what can we uh, say about Bitcoin. So first, if we, if we apply the commodity theory, those of you who know uh, Max Weber, you, can all, you could also think of these three theories as ideal types that we then use to compare uh, Bitcoin with. So, first of all, the commodity theory. On the one hand, you can say, well, certainly there's nothing behind uh, Bitcoin. The value of Bitcoin is certainly not founded in any sort of real <coughs> materiality. There's absolutely there's no gold behind Bitcoin. So on the one hand, you can say it's, it, the commodity theory certainly doesn't apply to Bitcoin because it's highly virtual. At the same time, um, at the same time, Bitcoin also shares some of the characteristics of gold money or a money system that is based on some kind of gold standard. First of all, there's an ultimate limit to the amount of Bitcoins that can be issued. Uh, it's uh, 21 uh, million. And that, that of course, has in the same way that there's a finite amount of gold on the planet. So that's the, the one point where they share the characteristics. The other one is that this limit is approached, uh, approached through a slow and labor-intensive process. So, um, and, and that's of course the mining uh, aspect of Bitcoin. And even, I mean, even the word mining, even if, if any of you, if any of you have seen the, this on the Bitcoin website, uh, I can't remember, is it the Bitcoin or, or one of the sort of key uh, Bitcoin, where you, where you can find this introductory video to um, Bitcoin, the way they illustrate Bitcoin or the mining process is with this little rock and then this small little uh, hammer or hack that does the tick, 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 ping, and then you have a, like a, inside the, the rock, there's a Bitcoin. That's how they illustrate it. So there's also the, there's an imagery around Bitcoin that sort of evokes these parallels to gold. And also if you see um, stories in the press on Bitcoin, they are, they t they're almost always illustrated by these sort of golden, Bitcoin coins, which is weird because the whole point of Bitcoin is in fact, no, there aren't any physical coins, and yet that's what the journalists also always uh, uh, put up there. So anyway, so there's um, uh, so there's this mining bit, and also you could say, well, if you have gold money, then new money comes into being uh, in decentralized points in the economy. This would be uh, gold miners who take them out of the ground, and in the same way, uh, and so it's not the state. The state cannot create new gold, uh, and banks also they can't create new gold. It's only miners can do that, and that's also the same in the so, so in a way, there's like this decentralized structure in, uh, in Bitcoin as well as in, in gold money. Um, Okay. And then it's a fourth, yeah. On on the the, the limit of, of Bitcoin, I yeah. mean, since Bitcoin is in a sense in the imaginary uh, yeah. uh, circle there, the limit itself is imaginary too. Unlike gold, which is a physical yeah. quality which has to be, as you said, dug yeah. out of the ground. 
this, this limit is, is not diagonal gravity, precisely that. It, it is, a, in a sense, a limit imposed by some kind of consensus, which of course yeah. can be broken, yeah. uh, and, and therefore be created. Yeah. And we're beginning to hear uh, reports already of how these limits can be pushed yeah. and extended and bent and so forth yeah. in that way. Yeah. So it's, no, that's not true. a limit. In no, no, no. That that is that that is true. That is true. And you could also say that even even if sort of the Bitcoin the Bitcoin Bitcoin limit cannot be, then the system can be replicated, which is already happening. So you have Litecoin and Ripplecoin yeah. and all this. So you can have all the forms that are that will. And the, so the forms or the specimens is unlimited. So I I, I agree with that. There's also a, a fourth parallel between this uh, commodity theory or commodity idea of money and, and Bitcoin, and it's it's actually what I think uh, you made that point uh, that I would argue that the value or the price of Bitcoin, to some extent, is an inverse function of the price or the functioning of conventional money. So I think if we if we are going to see another surge in the price of Bitcoin, I think it will be triggered by a crisis in the dollar or the renminbi or another currency. So people will move to the Bitcoin because it's seen as an alternative to this. And of course, Bitcoin, at least in our current uh, monetary system, gold tends to have that characteristic as well. So there's an inverse, there tends to be an inverse relation between uh, the dollar, the price of the dollar, and the price of gold. Uh, okay, so to sum up this first point, you could say that uh, Bitcoin is commodity theory, uh, commodity money without gold. Okay, so the next one, I want to uh, review Bitcoin in terms of the state theory. Uh, on the one hand, you could say, well, they are, they must be completely different because the whole point of Bitcoin is exactly that Bitcoin isn't issued by a central state authority. Um, so on the one hand, it's, it's very different from state money. At the same time, it's, um, it has the same characteristic as uh, this kind of uh, money because it's actually backed by nothing. It's, it is, in that sense, Bitcoin is a kind of fiat money. There's, there's nothing behind it. It could, I mean, in the same way that there's nothing behind a, a, a piece of paper with some uh, scribbles on it. Um, you could also say that's, that's one of the ways also that you can conceive of state money, is that state money is a, it's a, it's a, it's a credit without a, a debtor. So it's a credit, but there's no, What's the, so, so in the way my um, physical euro look, it's a credit. But what, who's the debtor here? Or who's the, who owes me this money? And in what form would it be paid? Um, you could also say that the, the, the debtor of Bitcoin is the community willing to accept Bitcoin. So that's the only way that I can redeem my Bitcoin is by buying the, the, the goods. With it, and that that ultimately depends on the, the producers of goods. Will they sell this uh, to me? Um, I was also thinking. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Just in terms of, of this, what's behind the, the hundred euros there. Yeah. With the state theory, but just you have an army. And yes. Who, so you have taxes. Who will collect? Who will ensure that the taxes yeah. are yeah. collected? Yeah. Prisons. Yes. Prisons. And yeah. Police forces. Yeah. So that, that is what's, but there doesn't seem to be the equivalent no. of Bitcoin. No. So, I think. And it, and it, so I've also sort of been playing around with whether we could think of Bitcoin as fiat money without a state. So it has some of the features of state money, but it doesn't have a state. And I found um, there's a guy called Max Kaiser, who has this show on uh, Russia Today, which is a television network, and he had this idea, he's very into uh, Bitcoin and all other things, and he had this interesting idea, so I think he just more or less just threw it out there, to say he said, 
he would recommend that Palestine adopt Bitcoin in order to, because now right now they, they, they have to do trades in, in the Israeli shekels. So they, they do trade in a currency that they don't control themselves. So in order to gain some sort of or more monetary sovereignty or more economic sovereignty, he said they should adopt the, uh, the Bitcoin. Even if, I mean, of course they can't control Bitcoin, but at least the Israelis don't control it either. And the interesting thing about it is that it shows that it kind of sort of invokes this comes or this problem or issue of sovereignty. And it shows us how sovereignty is very intimately connected with the money. Uh, and it also shows how Bitcoin may have even, I mean, even on the one hand, there's no sovereignty over Bitcoin, but at the same time, maybe Bitcoin can be used to subvert existing uh, structures of uh, sovereignty. Yeah? I mean, maybe John Nuker was saying maybe the platform or the algorithm becomes the new sovereignty. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I think so. But I, but I also think you would, I think, I think the, the, the Bitcoin is, it's so disruptive that we would even need to rethink the concept of sovereignty. What, what, what does sovereignty even mean then? A different kind, more distributed sovereignty, not the fact yeah. that it's yeah. demanding yeah. something, something really Exactly. Different. And the question is whether that, whether that is even sovereign, whether that's even sovereignty or whether it's even something else. Maybe I can't even... Say again? Maybe a worse kind. Well, it could be a, or, or a better one, or, or, a, or a system where everyone, everyone is sovereign, or... Uh, the people have more power generally to go in, in, Sorry, I can, I can talk about this. No, no, it's, it's like a, infrastructure. Yeah. Which I think was saying becomes power then, yeah. platforms or intermediate okay. Yeah. But you have control of this infrastructure. It's even more now. Uh, they're filtering out Netflix, for instance, on certain cable networks. So the, Infrastructure where bitcoins are circulating is actually owned by corporate. So, yeah. what yeah. you have might be a new sovereignty which is corporate sovereignty. Yeah, that's the, over the networks. Yeah, that's so. I, I, my point here is also not to say that um, bitcoin is good or bad or it's going to go this way or that way. I think my, my point, and that's my sort of general point, is that. At least, Bitcoin, what Bitcoin does is that it forces us to rethink some of these things. Uh, it re forces us to rethink money, and it forces us to rethink uh, sovereignty. And it also forces us to even think about the kind of sovereignty that is, that is uh, intrinsic to our existing money system. Uh, Just um, yeah? one, one addendum to that. Uh, yeah. um, Islamic State, of course, is now one of the main users of uh, Ooh, Bitcoin. Islamic State is one of the main users of Bitcoin. So there you have uh, um, the emergence of a quote new state, perhaps, yeah. with combined with violence. You know, um, yeah, a yeah. successful campaign of violence. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah. Wow, that's interesting. And that links it to commodity then as well because they're producing oil. Yeah. And we've seen that if you look at what the the, the drop in the oil price particularly coincidental when the US wanted to yeah. have a strike at Russia yeah. and the Saudis wanted to have strikes at Iran so you have to wonder was there a conversation there about yeah. dropping the price of oil. So when the IS start to get into it then the commodity gets more tight into it. Yeah. I, I, so that, I, I mean... Mm. If, if Bitcoin is a way of challenging the way you think about money, would you also find that something like Bitcoin is a way of I would, I would give you sort of a very academic, standard academic answer that I would say it would force us to even rethink what is art. But of course, that's a non question. I think it's a good question. I, think, I haven't thought about it, and I can't even come up with a, uh, an answer that is as good as your question. I, I would need to think more about it. Um, yeah? Shushek's rather impoverished ontological scheme here allows you to relate three different domains of yeah. that, as it were. The tour has originally come up with the inquiry of modes of these kind of existence, but a much, much richer ontological set and recognized all kinds of overlaps. So it, 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 when, the, when the art is the religious, when the political yeah. meets um, yeah. the, the fictional, for example, yeah. uh, it provides a very good framework for, for 
um, interrogating something as, yeah. as disruptive or, or as, 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 as homeless as Bitcoin. Yeah. The field of homeless concept. Yeah, I think, I think, mm, I think that the choice between Xi Jinping or the two is a matter of temperament. I think, and for me, the two becomes a little bit too much sort of. Well, anything can be an art paper. Well, you're already running out of your code, you've got three domains yeah, there. Yeah, I've got three, 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 three more. Yeah, but for me, I think that's the, the simplicity. The, <coughs> what I like about Xi Jinping, or the, I think one of the reasons why I sort of go back to it all the time, is that it kind of forces you to put everything into these three, which you can say that limits, but for me, that's exactly the uh, forces one to be more creative or more like, and I'm not saying that. Uh, I, th I think it's a matter of just personal taste more or less, but that's how it works for me. But I think your your comment with the or the debate we had with ISIS, I think it's a good illustration of the way that so we hear the story all the time, oh yeah, financialization, virtualization, the material doesn't matter anymore. But then if we sort of force ourselves to rethink through this, we see no, it certainly does matter a lot. And uh, and uh, obviously the, the the issue of oil is also an important part of, could be, we could have also put oil in here in a way. Um, and, and certainly if we start thinking about Bitcoin and ISIS, and we need to put the you know, oil in, put violence and stuff like that. Yeah. Taxation is one of the pillars of Islam. You can't even address the Islamic State's use of money in this really like the way that, that, that um, taxation has, has, goes right back into the United States. It's part of Islam from the very, very start. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not just about blogging oil. <laughs> no, no. Uh, it's going to play a structural role. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, okay, so the third one here is our uh, credit theory. And you can, s so one of the features and one of the reasons why credit money has become so dominant in our contemporary money system is because credit money is virtual. It doesn't have to be, it's basically it's just something, numbers in a book or digits on a ledger or something like that. So we can, and that makes it, uh, that means that we can, it's very useful or it's, today if you want to make electronic payments, which we do most of the time, uh, we use credit money because with this, the way things, I'm going to come back to that, but the way it's structured now, we can't make uh, we can't make electronic payments with this kind of money unless we are a bank. It's a little bit complicated. If you're a private person, you can't do that. So, um, and and obviously, Bitcoin shares that characteristic with credit money. It's also virtual. It's 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 nothing but a, an accounting trick, so to speak. Um, uh, and 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 that also means that the way the way Bitcoin circulates is the same way that bank money circulates. So we, you don't have like the physical money. You will you tend to have like a physical interaction with the other person. Uh, whereas with this kind of money, you can trade with someone in Japan, and you don't have to look at them or something like you can just transfer it. So that's the similarity is this virtuality. However, there are also some important differences. One, of course, is that Bitcoin is not issued by a bank. This money is issued by a bank, a commercial bank. However, um, uh, Bitcoin isn't. That's not to say that you can't build a bank on top of Bitcoin. And that has been done. Uh, if some of you are familiar with the the MT Gox scandal, well, I think that was in the beginning of 2014, where there was a, there was a it was kind of like a Bitcoin deposit bank, uh, where people would put their, uh, rather than having Bitcoin in their own wallet, they would put it into this sort of Bitcoin bank, and then this bank went bust. Uh, it turned out that they didn't have all the Bitcoin money that they said they had, um, and so people lost uh, a lot of money on that, or some people lost some bitcoins on that. And some people said, some people said, ah, that just proves, well, bitcoin is a scam and all this. But I think what I think MT Gox proves exactly 
Uh, for me, the point was another one. It was, no, 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 what MT Gox proved was that fractional reserve banking is a scam. That's what MT Gox proved. It didn't say anything about Bitcoin, and because um, in, in a sense, it, was, it, it wasn't part of Bitcoin. It was just something that was built on top of Bitcoin. And, um, and the difference, um, I'm going to mention this, but I may come, but may also come back to it in a minute. One of the key differences between this kind of, this system uh, and uh, Bitcoin is that with Bitcoin, there's no practical, uh, if you want to hold Bitcoin, you can either have it in your own wallet or you can have it in the bank. But the one you have in your own wallet are exactly as useful, practically useful for payments as the other one. However, with ordinary money, we don't have that option. If I want to make electronic payments and I have to do that, then I have to go to, then I have to keep my money in the bank. There's no other way. Of course, I can take some of these and stuff it into my mattress. However, when I want to make payments, it becomes very cumbersome. So in this system, we have like two different kinds of money, whereas with Bitcoin, they, there's just this one level. So there's no practical reason for me to move my money, my Bitcoin, from my private wallet into some sort of Bitcoin deposit bank uh, account. I'll, I will come back to that in a second. Another uh, difference, key difference between this kind of the, the standard credit theory or this kind of credit money and Bitcoin is that new, when, when, we, when we create new money in this system, we also create new debt. So whenever there's a more, there's a, an additional supply of money, this is an additional supply of debt. And debt tends to increase faster than money because there's interest on it. So we have a system today where the amount of debt in the world grows faster than the amount of money. And what central bank or bankers or politicians, the, the way they try to solve this is to say, I think we need to make more money. However, the problem is that then they also make more debt and they just get trapped in this uh, yeah, a vicious circle. However, with Bitcoin, when new money is created, it's, there's no debt, there's no equivalent debt. There's just more money. Uh, so you can, we can, with Bitcoin, we can create new money free of debt. <coughs> then there's a third difference between credit money and Bitcoin, which is that Bitcoin is an independent currency. It's its own currency, whereas this money, which is created by a private bank, say that's the bank that I think you know, I don't know. Uh, they don't have their own currency. So they use they are kind of parasitic on the state currency. So when they use, when they issue new money in Denmark, they will issue it denominated in Danish crowns. Uh, so they don't have their own, they're not responsible for their own currency. So they kind of borrow the currency of the state. Um, uh, and with Bitcoin, that obviously isn't the case because Bitcoin is Bitcoin. I mean, new Bitcoins are created as Bitcoins, not as new crowns or something like that. Um, so to sum up this part, we can say that um, that Bitcoin is credit money without debt. So now we have three, I think uh, Danuk already, already referred to them. So Bitcoin is commodity, commodity money without gold, state money, uh, fiat money without a state, and credit money without debt. So that kind of sort of sums up the, um, the this analysis of, uh, of Bitcoin. Um, so I started by saying, so what is the value of, well, let's think about this value of Bitcoin uh, and value not in terms of price, but value in terms of philosophical or ideological value. One of the things I've noticed is that with Bitcoin, there's, of course, there's been a lot of critique also of Bitcoin. There's, so there's one saying, oh yeah, Bitcoin is just a huge Ponzi scheme and it's, a, yeah, um, and it's, it's just a way of, uh, 
for early adopters to make money on the latecomers. It's also very insecure, uh, it can be uh, tampered with and all this. And another standard critique uh, is that it can be used for illicit uh, activities. You, some of you may know the Silk Road incident where uh, Bitcoin was used to buy drugs uh, online. Some say it was also used to buy, uh, get someone to kill your wife or, or another person that you wanted to kill. You can buy that on the web and you can play with the uh, uh, Bitcoin. Okay, so, but for me, the interesting thing about these critiques is not so much to test whether they apply. So is Bitcoin a Ponzi scheme or and can it be used for illicit and is it insecure? However, what I found interesting was that all of these critiques, I think, could as well or even more uh, be applied to our existing money system. So, I mean, this is a, for me, this is a Ponzi scheme, and it's a much bigger Ponzi scheme. A fractional reserve banking is a Ponzi scheme. And uh, even if we accept that Bitcoin is a Ponzi scheme, it's not nearly as big as this one. So, so that's one thing you can kind of say. And also, with the insecurity, although first, I don't know this is a outside of my area of expertise, but it is my impression that there's also a lot of insecurity in the conventional banking system, and there's, of course there's people tampering with this. And you could even go further and say, well, what the, what the crisis has shown us is that the whole, this whole banking system is extremely insecure. It can collapse at any moment and take uh, the rest of the economy down with it. So, um, so even if even if Bitcoin is insecure, it's not nearly as insecure as the, the, the whole system. And then finally, you could also say, well, yes, perhaps, or yes, obviously, Bitcoin can be used for illicit purposes. However, I think the existing money system provides ample opportunities for that as well. I think the drug dealers have done very well with cash over the years, and you could even argue that. This uh, this credit. If you wanna if you wanna use this for illicit purposes like tax evasion, so you have to be very rich. So it's only the very rich people who sort of move their money to Virgin Islands and so. so and what Bitcoin provides is a democrat democratization of uh, tax evasion. So you can so ordinary people can also do tax evasion now. Yeah, of course you should be a little. Uh, yeah, I'm not uh, condoning uh, tax, but I'm just saying if we want to do tax evasion, I think we should all have the opportunity to do it. So uh, yeah. I think this compromise that. Uh, so anyway, so anyway, so so the my, so my point here is, it's just it's even in even with the it's it seems to me that this the critique of Bitcoin is what you uh, in in psychoanalysis is known as. Um, Transference or prediction, I can't remember. But anyway, so you have you, you sort of have your own problems or your own issues, and then you sort of project them onto someone else, uh, saying, "Oh, this guy's a liar," or "This guy's whatever." And really, what you're saying is that no, I'm the. And I think that's what's going on with the critique of or the reception of Bitcoin is that all the melodies of our existing system they are sort of projected onto Bitcoin. Uh, and that for me, again, I think Bitcoin in itself is extremely interesting. But for me, mm, my interest in Bitcoin is perhaps not so much Bitcoin itself, but it's more the way it sort of reflects back on the existing system. Um, I would like, uh, since I'm up here, and I would like to sort of Use this opportunity to shelf my own political idiosyncrasies down your throat and present you with my own idea of uh, an ideal money system. I, I would say, on the one hand, I would say my position on so what kind of money should we have in the future. I think the more the merrier. I think I would like a future system with a lot of different money systems, local currencies. 
Bitcoin, uh, a lot of different systems. It, it, a little bit like when you think of, um, when you talk about resilience in ecology, you say that resilience as an ecological system, the more diverse it is, the more different kinds of species you have interacting, the more resilient the system is. And I think the same applies to uh, money. And I think one of the errors or one of the risks or one of the failures of, of our existing is that we have a money, more or less a monetary monoculture. So we sort of put all our eggs in one basket. Uh, and when that basket or when that basket drops or when it's, then the whole thing kind of shakes. So I think if we had more different uh, money system, we would have a more stable, uh, better economy. So, however, one for me, one of the key features of a future and better money system, reform money system, would be one where where um, where we have a uh, money reform. So, uh, it has different names. Sometimes it's referred to as full reserve banking. Sometimes it's referred to as 100% banking. Sometimes the Chicago plan. And sometimes, which I think is the concept I like best, sovereign money creation. Um, what this means, this is, uh, if any of you are familiar with uh, the organization Positive Money, that's what they are working on. Uh, so I very much agree on with them. So the idea is that the state or the central bank has a monopoly on printing these. And we all agree, or most of us, agree that's a very good thing. I mean, we have to be very, 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 very extremely libertarian to say, yeah, let's just uh, let everyone print counterfeit money and then see who's better at it. I, a lot of people, or most people would sort of agree, no, no, it's best that the central bank um, prints uh, the money. And everyone else who tries to do that, they go to jail. Uh, and in fact, in the 19th century, there was, uh, uh, private banks had the capacity to print their own money. And that resulted in a lot of instability and repeated crisis. And then at some point, they said in uh, various European countries, this doesn't work. We need to centralize the creation of money. We need so the uh, these uh, central banks were founded, and they got the monopoly of printing uh, physical money. Today, however, we've had uh, technological innovations that means that mm, our payment systems today are largely electronic, they're digital. So we need to remove, renew this monopoly and say it's not enough that banks that the central bank has the monopoly on the creation of physical money, this monopoly has to be extended so that they also have the monopoly of creating electronic money. And what this means is that the creation of money and what is, known, what is called financial intermediation, those two functions are split up. So you say the central bank should create new money, private banks, they should then be intermediaries between uh, depositors or investors and people who want to borrow money. So the idea is that the central bank makes money, someone takes this money, says to the bank, I have all this money, I would like some interest on it. Can you find someone who wants to, uh, I was confused, borrow money then, because it's the same word in English. If you, this is borrow, this is lend, yeah. So can you find out someone who wants to borrow it, right? And uh, and in that process, and then they go out and find someone who wants to borrow it, and then my money is then transferred to this guy. Uh, and then, of course, the bank takes a little cut, and I'll get interest rates on it. But in that process, no new money is created. So we need to sort of separate these two functions. Um, this sovereign money system has some similarities with Bitcoin. I've already touched upon them. Um, one is, in Bitcoin, the money, the private money user interacts directly with the central ledger. So when I make a payment from my Bitcoin wallet, it goes directly into Gianluca's Bitcoin wallet through the ledger. So there's no middleman here. And in a sovereign money creation system, you would have the same because 
Today, when I want to make electronic payments, I use my credit card, my Visa card. So I go through my private bank and into another private bank. However, with a sovereign money system, my, I would no longer have my, my payment account would no longer be in a private bank. It would be directly with the central bank. So I, have, I, have, I would have a deposit account with the central bank. And whenever I make a payment, money is transferred from my wallet, so to speak, in the central bank to Jan Lucas' wallet in the central bank. So we don't need we, we don't need the banks to make payments. We can just do that directly through the central bank. Another, um, um, another, I've also on another good feature, or for me, plus the feature of this sovereign money system, is that whenever new money is created, we don't necessarily create new debt. So, this, so we can we can imagine that the central bank, there would be like a money creation committee in the central bank, and they would say, okay, now. Um, we can see in the economy that it would be a good idea to make a little bit more money, uh, increase the supply of money with 1% or something. This new money is then created out of nothing, put into a wallet in this uh, central ledger, and then it would be given to the government for spending. So they could use it to lower taxes, or they could just spend it on infrastructure or whatever they would like. However, this would just this would put the money directly into circulation without additional debt. And the economic benefits of that, there, there are several benefits of that. Um, but one of them is exactly that we can disconnect the growth in the supply of money from the growth of debt. Um, and finally, that it, that's related to this. Whenever new money is created in this system, the seniorage, the, the value of this money, the seniorage, goes not to private banks, but it goes to the community, to, to the nation, so to speak, in the form of the government. So we will also benefit from this. Of course, we have to trust that the, the government will use it for good purposes. That's, uh, that's yeah. But, but still, I think it's, it's better than having private banks just getting it and uh, using it for whatever they feel best. Um, yeah, I think I would, I can talk for another hour and a half about uh, sovereign money creation, but I will not do that. Uh, rather, I would invite comments and questions from you. Yeah. Um, just picking up on this thing about the army. Yeah. And it's interior, the army just is involved. Um, if you think of um, if you think of parole point you know, the duty of citizens being for you point that an army is like I said, it can show ten soldiers marching out to war. And that in a sense part of the problem. And it addresses the ISIS issue as well. If you have a society where there's too much obedience, then you have things like an army. Mm -hmm. But if you have a bunch of individuals with individuals with consciences, then they decide whether or not they decide to fall on the line and march off or indeed depend currencies or do all of those other things. It also addresses the point about art. Because art is fundamentally about disobedience uh, at heart. It's not, not accepting the strictures of the society. So you can have real art, mm -hmm. symbolic art, and imaginary art, just like real mm -hmm. symbolic and imaginary art. Mm -hmm. You could apply the same analysis to that. Yeah, and you could you can even now we in this uh, it, it, you could think through so if so if Bitcoin is a technology that may potentially obstruct mm, conventional notions of sovereignty and institutions of sovereignty. What, what kind of thing could we imagine a, a who develop a technology that would also kind of disrupt that army technology? Could we have I, I can't even really think through that, but it would be could we along the lines of Bitcoin think of something that would make uh, I, I would think about this uh, not so much with, uh, with the army, but especially with police. Now these uh, riots in uh, in, uh, in the U.S. What would it take for these police officers to say, "No, we're not going to hit these people. We're just going to stay at home"? Or how 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 would you 
would you need to target their mothers or get their mothers to tell them to what, what would you do? Uh, yeah, I, I don't have a fucking uh, answer to that. But I think, it's, yeah, it's also, you, I know that you've been thinking about this idea of uh, the disruption technologies. So uh, it's kind of along those lines. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. Can I just, just to take up your, your last point, sir, about that kind of full reserve banking suite? Yeah. I mean, it is very imaginary. So, but there, there must be some kind of crucial steps that you would have to take to yeah. to move from yeah. because you've got this system and then you've got a kind of yeah. parallel yeah. universe almost yeah. it's like Harry yeah. Potter world. Yeah. But there must be some yeah. some key decisions that would have to be taken. Yeah. So could you maybe identify some of those and maybe decisions? Yeah. Like, I, it's I, that's it's a good question, and it's uh, and it's largely a strategic question. So and we've been, so I'm I'm also involved now. I mentioned positive money, which is this UK organization, but I'm also involved with like a Danish sister organization called uh, Good Pay, Good Money. Um, so and we've, so the idea is what, how can we facilitate or how can we, first of all, how can we even push the issue of money into the political agenda where it, it's not there at the moment or. There's bits and pieces, but it's largely absent. So this issue of who should create the money. But also, a little bit further down the line is also to say, what would we need to do? And for me, I, I've been thinking, I think one of the first steps to take was to persuade politicians to say, you should give private persons the opportunity to have an account with the central bank. In the same way, so banks have this. Commercial banks, they all have an account with the central bank. Uh, but I, I can't have that. I can't get that. So I need to go through my uh, private. That's also the problem now with the quantitative easing that yeah, uh, the UK government and now also the ECB has engaged in, is that they, they print, or they don't print it because they don't do that physically, but they make all this new money out of nothing. So to speak. So it's, however, their problem, the ECB's problem is, once they've made it, how can they get it into the economy? And what they didn't do is spend it directly into the economy. <coughs> Rather, what they do is that they use it to buy assets from private banks. So the, so they end up first they, they they go to the private banks, and then what the private banks, what they're hoping the private banks will do is that they will turn around and let it out to small and medium-sized businesses, which is not what they do. They turn around and let it out to people who want to speculate on houses or buy stocks and grow up new bubbles. And that's largely what's happening. So in this system, if, if we all had an account with the central bank or with ECB, then ECB could say, yeah, now we've made all this one trillion euros or whatever, we'll put them We'll either give it directly to your governments and they can spend it, or we'll just give it directly to you. But the key issue is to, you, you can give it into the money. However, I think something that could be sort of concealed as an innocent proposal would be to say to the policy, oh, please, just give us an account with the central bank. But, but what that would do is that it would give people the option to say, yes, I want to make electronic money. However, I'm not so sure that my bank is reliable, or this banking system is reliable. So I, I'd rather just keep my money in my wallet with the central bank. So I have this choice. So it's not just a choice between having these in my mattress or money in my deposit account. No, I can even have an electronic state account. Uh, that would also reveal, this was also something Gianluca, he, he, he touched upon, the whole this whole scheme rests upon our thinking that this kind of money and this kind of money is the same. I think if we had a wallet, if we could have a wallet with the central bank, we would start thinking, is that really the same kind of money as the ones with my bank? Are they as secure as the ones in my bank? So I think gradually people would say, no, I better put it with the central bank. So you'd have like a controlled bank run, so to speak, controlled demolition of the um, but I think, for me, that would be the first step. And in fact, I have a colleague 
and his girlfriend, she works at the central bank. She has that. So in order to have an account with the central bank, a deposit account, you need to be either a bank or work there. So it's just saying, well, the people, we just need, all of us just need that time with account. Okay. There are parallels to this. I mean, if you think that a central bank is a weak, is, is the, is the, uh, the whole set of money. Yeah. Right? And the banks, are, the, the, yeah. the private banks are retailers. Yeah. Um, but if we see what technology has done to the way people buy things now, because you, you had hotel, wholesalers who needed retailers to get to their customers, but now they don't. So that, that parallel already exists. Oh, that's a really, I, I'm gonna, yeah. Just gonna write that down, because that's a really good. Uh, and interestingly, in Ireland, if you just take Ireland, Ireland's just set up a state investment bank. And that's, that's precisely the, the rationale, is to take, to, to have a state bank which will deal not with individuals but with, with companies. And to but buy can, so because, because of that precise problem you, you But will they will they how will they will they still use private banks as an interface? No 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 the idea so they've set up a state investment bank as a separate bank. But you can have an account? No, no, but it's only for investing in companies. Yeah. But they they also have Allied Irish banks which is a, a, a prime vehicle to just submerge a kind of, uh, because that, that's Allied Irish Banks is wholly owned by the state. Mm -hmm. So it could easily just uh, merge the Allied Irish Banks with the central bank and yeah. achieve what true Allied Irish Banks we had, achieve we had, what they're trying to do for the individuals as against. Yeah. We've had, in Denmark we had the, we had the post bank, so, the, so you can make, bef this was before the internet, you could make sort of, uh, you could make payments through the post office. So they had their own payment system. Mm -hmm. And then that evolved into a, at some point it evolved into a proper bank. So you actually had a state bank that could do some functions of, and I know someone who worked there, and she said they could do all sorts of things. It was a really good thing. And then of course what happened was that it was privatized, mm -hmm. of course. And then now we don't have that anymore. So you have a... Yeah, I, I was going to pick up on the idea of the central bank uh, having accounts with that because um, I'm really concerned about issues of control. I mean, thinking, for example, take Ireland and Cyprus during the crisis. Yeah. So Ireland guaranteed all the bank accounts yeah. and, and you know, suffered as a result. Cyprus just did a big haircut on a lot of the accounts. Yeah. So if you had a, a savings account, you know, you lost yeah, yeah, yeah. what, a third or more of it by, by simple government decree. Yeah. Um, by virtue of being part of the banking system. But that would be my, so, but I think one of the, the next, so the first step is, let's have these uh, accounts, or the opportunity to, to open an account with mm -hmm. the central bank. The next step would to say, was to say, let's abolish uh, deposit insurance, or at least uh, sort of Nash or, or government involvement in deposit insurance because you could say to people, well, if you worry about your money in the bank, you can just put it in the central bank and you can't have a run on the central bank. No. That's impossible. Mm -hmm. It's like the end. So, so, so you wouldn't have that problem and you could, and that you could use that as an argument to say, well, then they can take care of themselves, right? Um, so, uh, yeah, so I think that the, the problem would kind of solve itself. But if you had an economic crisis like this country has had, yeah. would then you just try to have your run on the central bank? Well, the thing is, when you have a run on a bank, is you go into the bank and you ask for another kind of money. So what you do is you go into a private bank and ask for the state money, right? I go into my private bank and say, I want physical money. And they don't have that. Well, they have very little. However, if I have my money in the central bank, first of all, there would be no need for me to get it out because... Yeah, but the, the thing is, this money, the money that I have with the central bank, there's no risk to it. It can't, because they don't do fractional reserve bank. They don't lend it out, it's just there, right? And even, even, if, I, if, even if for some reason, there would be no need for it, but even, if we all said, oh, now we want to go to the central bank and ask for physical cash, they can say, yeah, fine. So it's well, just print it and then we'll give it to you. Say again? Yeah, but that's not the point of, yeah, but it's, it's not, the, the argument here is not, 
let's give this privilege to the central bank and then we can just print all i mean that's been tried before in history with very little success so of course you should be careful with how you institutionalize the decision power to say how much money should be created but the idea is to say on the the idea is that we would need to set up and i think such a committee already you're already in so right now the central bank is a semi sort of autonomous institution so they will make semi autonomous decisions on for instance interest rates so they have like a money monetary policy committee or something and they would make this kind of decisions. So you would have an equivalent sovereign money creation committee in the central bank that would make this kind of decision. Say, okay, so this this month we will print another whatever, 10 billion, or make another 10 billion euros and put it into circulation. And then this money, they would then give that to the government, and then the government could decide what they wanted to use it for. But it's not like the government could say, oh, we have an election coming up, could you please print a hundred billion uh, euros so that people are happy and they will vote for us. You, you want to sort of separate those. Oh, but there is a fair argument against that, that you can't trust that public decision making and whatever yeah. that, that the checks and balances yeah. you put in place there, they can be captured. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, think, I think there's two, and I, there's two things to say about that. First, if you have, if you, if you don't, if you have a, a state that you can't, that you don't trust, this system is not necessarily better than what we have, I think. So it presupposes that you have a, a state that is functioning more or less okay. So that's the one thing. The other thing is this money creation committee, they don't have to be perfect. They just have to be marginally better than these guys. Uh, they just have to be marginally better than private banks. And it's not like private banks are evil or anything, but they are just they have another incentive. I mean they are private corporations that have to make a profit and that's that's sort of their job. So whereas the central bank doesn't have that, uh, that uh, yeah, they don't have to think about that. So but I, I mean I agree that of course one should be also critical towards the state and how this is I'm kind of thinking whether we're, we're moving on to the workshops after this. Should we have I have a break? Quick, quick question, perhaps just but there are no other. Do we not? I, I'm thinking whether we should allow for a little time for uh, a break. Yeah, I mean, by the time we move and so on. Yeah, I'm a big fan of breaks. I think. <laughs> <laughs> uh, whatever you invest early in a break comes back uh, <laughs> later with a profit. Yeah. So I, I think we should. I'm not the only. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, I'm the one fine. standing up, so now I'm saying let's uh, take a break. There's a chair here, you can sit. <laughs>